attending our tutorial on large language models on human like metadata. This tutorial is a collaborative effort among myself, Dr. Subha, and Dr. Manish Gupta. I am Monica. I recently completed my postdoctoral research at the University of Bonn under the supervision of Professor Lucy. Please note that Dr. Subha and Dr. Manish will introduce themselves during the presentation. Please stop. Now let's proceed to the agenda of today's tutorial. First, Manish will start the session by revisiting the fundamentals of large language models and utilizing LLMs to generate annotations for reasoning tasks. Subha will delve into the reasoning data sets and evaluating the annotations produced by LLMs. Finally, I will introduce Hello. you to the auto labeling tool, tools and addressing the challenges of hallucinations in LLM generated annotations. Since both speakers are attending online, feel free to ask questions whenever you'd like. Just raise your hand. I'll pass the microphone to you. Now I would like to invite Dr. Manish Gupta, who is joining us online to introduce about himself and begin his presentation. Uh, thank you, Monica. Uh, Monica, can you just confirm if uh, uh, folks can hear me fine, see me fine and see the slides fine? Yes, yes, everything is fine. Sir. Oh, great. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Manish. Uh, uh, I work at Microsoft as a principal applied scientist. Uh, I also work as an adjunct faculty at IIIT Hyderabad and a visiting faculty at the Indian School of Business. Right. And um, uh, very happy to present this tutorial uh, with Monica and Subha in, in this uh, uh, awesome venue. Um, uh, I mean, you know, Subha and I apologize for not being able to be uh, present there in person, but we'll try to do as best as we can. And thanks to Monica for uh, for taking care of all the logistics. Right? So we'll get started. Uh, and as Monica mentioned, I'll basically start with uh, introduction to large language models. How can we and, and, and basically later delve into how can we generate annotations for reasoning tasks uh, using these large language models in the first one third of the tutorial. Right? Um, so let's get started with the first part, um, LLMs and their capabilities. Now, notice that uh, the research in large language models is so vast these days that it's sort of difficult to capture that in 25 minutes, but I'll try to summarize and do as best as I can. Right? So um, the, the basic uh, field is broadly called as deep learning, and uh, people started, uh, you know, uh, working uh, uh, working to a large extent in deep learning uh, around 2000 you know 2012 2013 onwards of course people have been working in this area of deep learning for a very long period of time maybe you know uh, folks who have been actually originally working in this field um, they have been doing things for more than 5 decades but uh, the recent interest in deep learning started around 2012 2013 um, and people love deep learning because compared to traditional machine learning, uh, like traditional machine learning classifiers like SVMs, KNN, Nibase, and so on, um, you know, deep learning engineers do not need to do this extra step of feature extraction, right? So in machine learning, people had to do feature extraction and then build classifiers on top. But uh, deep learning is great because the neural network model by itself basically does feature extraction and classification both, so as to be able to solve uh, any kind of classification task. Now, of course, uh, uh, deep learning models have not just been used for classification, but for generative use cases as well. Uh, but broadly, that's the main difference between traditional machine learning and deep learning. Clearly, deep learning is a way of doing machine learning itself. And deep learning methods are all dependent on this architecture called neural networks, which start, which, which basically have these three things, input layer, output layer, and some hidden layers. Now, the research in deep learning basically has progressed from traditional artificial neural networks, which just make use of dense or linear layers, to uh, layers which basically could be convolutional in nature, leading to convolutional neural networks for images, or layers which could be recurrent in nature, or, uh, or, or also have memory cells, leading to uh, interesting networks like recurrent neural networks and long short-term memories or LSTMs. Right? CNNs became very popular for images, RNNs and LSTMs became very popular for handling text kind of data. And then uh, in 2017, an interesting thing happened called as transformers, which uh, basically changed more or less the way people use these deep learning kind of models for most of uh, knowledge reasoning and uh, natural language processing. Right. Um, so uh, transformer, mod uh, of course, before transformer models, people were trying to evolve RNNs and LSTMs to encoder-decoder models for generative use cases. 
to attention based models so as to mimic the human way of paying attention to different strings in a uh, in in the input uh, while generating outputs right? uh, and both of these this this attention kind of a method sort of led to the idea of transformers which evolved into um, which evolved into uh, a BERT, GPT, T0, BART, and T5 models later. BERT is basically nothing but pre-trained encoder, transformer encoder. GPT is basically nothing but pre-trained transformer decoder. T5 is basically pre-trained transformer encoder decoder. Right? Uh, and then there are other models as well, like T0 and BART and so on, which came up one by one in the field of NLP. Uh, later, as I will talk about in more detail, people also came up with the prompt based models. The prompt based models basically came up because of this interesting idea um, that, hey, when you look at humans, well, a single human can do so many tasks. Why do you need a different model for different tasks? Uh, that basic idea essentially led to this uh, uh, to, to, the, to these prompt based models, um, GPT-3, T0, MT0, Instruct GPT, and, and the notion of prompting as we know today. Right? So um, and and this uh, thing of prompting sort of started uh, from from GPT three onwards. Um, OpenAI sort of uh, really believed in this principle that humans do not really require large supervised data sets to learn new tasks, and a single human can actually do many many tasks by this simple uh, just just by being uh, um, you know uh, ordered or commanded using this simple directive in natural language. Please tell me if this sentence describes something happy or something sad, right? I mean, you just need to tell people that, hey, it is a task. And uh, sometimes you need to give maybe a tiny number of demonstrative examples so just to explain the task to them, but you don't need to really give them like a thousand or 10,000 kind of examples so as to fine tune them in their senses, right? And you literally don't have different humans to do different tasks. The same human can actually do many tasks. So uh, the idea was sort of borrowed and a traditional fine tuning thing uh, you know, uh, was no longer required by GPT-3 kind of models. Traditional fine tuning basically means you have a model and you basically have some labeled data, let's say in this example, uh, translation data, and you would use this model so as to be able to translate these things, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to fine tune this model to translate these things. Fine tuning would really mean updating the weights, doing gradient updates on the model itself so that its parametric memory changes. And uh, essentially, um, you know, it learns to be able to do this task separately. Right? But this fine tuning was no longer no longer required. GPT-3 basically said, "I don't want to fine tune on any spe specific task. I've learned a good enough, uh, you know, uh, a good enough model, good enough base model, so that at test time itself, at inference time itself, you can basically just tell me what task you want me to do. Translate English to French, and hey, just give me the English word, I'll translate it." But they also realized that hey, doing one shot kind of a uh, you know modeling is better in the sense that give me one example and I can do the task better, or give me like three examples at test time, not for training, not for gradient updates, and I can do even better. Okay, and this kind of a paradigm uh, started being called as in context learning. So in the context, you basically just give me the, enough material for me to learn the task at runtime and be able to do that task rather than actually training me separately or fine tuning me separately. Uh, now, this was good, but it was not really very accurate. It was accurate. Of course, it was reasonably good, but it was not as accurate. And therefore, people said that, hey, how about trying to train this model uh, to follow instructions exactly like humans do? And to be able to do that, these models had to be trained in a way uh, that, that humans are trained uh, in some ways or, or basically closely mimic human labeled data. So, uh, so they said that, hey, you might have a pre-trained model like GPT-3, and what we would do then is to do supervised fine-tuning, uh, not in a task-specific manner still. I mean, you will still want the model to be as task-agnostic as possible, but on instruction-following data, in the sense that we would make it learn how to follow human instructions. Okay, So, so I, again, I mean, due to time, we'll not basically go into details of this, but uh, basically data was of this kind, explain the moon landing to a six year old and you would actually have some human written data there and you would make the model learn how to answer these things and follow the human instruction like that. Okay. Later, they basically also said that, hey, you know, if the model can actually nicely identify which, is, which answer is good versus which answer is bad or rank them in order of how much they are good or how much they are bad, the model can be even better. And that is what motivated people uh, to actually uh, use reinforcement learning kind of scenarios uh, to be able to further train this model. 
So uh, people typically started using uh, something called as reinforcement learning uh, with uh, reinforcement learning methods like PPO and more recently methods called like DPO, uh, direct preference optimization and so on. Uh, so as to train the model using preference data. So if I am given a question and I'm given, given four answers to that question, which of them is preferred? Right. Of course, this required a whole bunch of human labeling so as to give them preference data, which one is preferred, and then the model would sort of learn uh, how to respect this preference data and uh, sort of therefore come up with uh, the right uh, right answers. Okay. So that was that, um, and uh, all of this basically uh, led to large language models like ChatGPT, GPT-40, and so on. Uh, you know, uh, which uh, essentially can behave as good as humans on many, many natural language processing tasks that you see here, and of course, including several reasoning tasks as well. Okay. Now, in industry, I work at Microsoft. At Microsoft, what we ended up doing is to then, you know, not use uh, humans any longer to generate labeled data. Remember, we are we at Microsoft need to get so much of human labeling done. Uh, for Bing, for example, we need to continuously monitor if for particular queries we are getting the right uh, documents or not. So relevance labeling is like a continuously running task across several languages, several regions, and several categories of queries. Right. So we no longer, uh, we sort of started moving slowly from human labeled data to GPT-4 kind of labeled data, chat GPT, GPT-4, of course, as those models evolved. Why? Mainly because it was way cheaper. It basically reduced the number of uh, you know uh, number of dollars that we need to spend. Um, we also basically got faster turnaround. Uh, I mean, in certain in certain languages like uh, Chinese, Arabic, Russian, we couldn't really get those many humans to label data for us, which meant that labeling was super slow. Right, and therefore, you know, using these models was a boon for us because we could get this data much faster. There was agility. There were a lot of developer savings on hit app creation for crowdsourcing with humans. You need to create hit apps. Now, of course, here with the models, you need to write prompts, but still it was much faster to be able to iterate over those prompts and create those uh, those hit apps for models or prompts for models. Right. And more importantly, quality. There was consistency in terms of quality uh, when we used models versus when we basically depended on humans, specifically a variety of humans across several languages. Right. Uh, the interesting part about GPT was uh, that uh, several of these uh, people who wanted to get their task done, uh, several of them actually moved from training their own models to directly using GPT. They said that, hey, we would use uh, human labeled data and train our models. Now, no longer we need to do that. We can basically direct leverage GPT models to be able to, uh, to, to get the inferences rather than training our own models. Yeah. Uh, and the most important part was you could do prompt engineering. You could basically, uh, of course, uh, you, could, you couldn't change hit app guidelines to humans, but here you could basically change your prompt anytime. And, uh, you know, a good task description would basically give you good results. Giving more examples would give you more results. Um, you know, you could try multiple prompts and try to mimic judgments from multiple humans in that senses. You could, of course, change the temperature and mimic multiple humans. Um, you could control how the output would look like. You could control the output length, output language, output style, um, you know, by, by appropriately designing the prompt in that right manner. Okay. And that is basically what motivated this tutorial uh, where we basically want to, be, we want to explore how good LLMs are as human-like human annotators in that sense. And the interesting part is that, uh, yes, I mean, you know, these LLMs are so powerful now uh, that you can do various kinds of interesting tasks like summarization, question answering, and many others that I'll talk about. Uh, earlier models could only do extractive summarization, but these models now can also do abstractive summarization uh, to a very good quality level. Earlier models could do factual or factoid question answering. Like if, if you asked basically, you know, what is the capital of India? Well, it could give you New Delhi, but uh, these models now uh, could actually take paragraphs from different web pages and still answer these complex questions. Like what was the former band of the member of Mother Love Bone who died just before the release of Apple? Now there is no answer on a single web page on the plan on, on, on the web, right? But fortunately, and, and this is so confusing a query, mother, love, bone. Now, you know, that's the name of a band and neither it is mother, nor love, nor bone, right? But it's basically able to still uh, join the evidence across multiple web pages, figure out facts that can help it answer the questions and come up with the right answer. Uh, you know, figure out, figure out the answer and you know, come up with the right answer. Okay. Now, similarly, you know, large language models, these models basically great, made great advances in other fields like machine translation, uh, coming up with these ad creatives automatically, uh, you know, machine reading comprehension, where you are given a large passage and a question, and you want to come up with an answer. 
um, and even solving very complex reasoning problems. So remember in school we would do these kinds of logical reasoning problems uh, where you know you're given uh, you're, you're supposed to follow the instructions start from some starting point and on a graph paper we would mark the origin of the starting point turn left we would move left to the one by one unit turn right and so on. Now you can actually ask these models to generate these answers automatically and that to give you full reasoning full full chain of reasoning why this is correct. Okay. Um, and then you could also basically give questions like like these uh, to the models, uh, which sentence is the correct adjective order. And honestly, you know, to the level that I learned English in my school, I never learned uh, what is the right order of adjectives that one has to prepare before a noun. And this is the model which basically taught me, well, there is a rule to do that. Uh, you must have opinion adjectives before size adjectives, age adjectives, shape adjectives, and so on. So, and therefore, you know, uh, the option A is correct uh, as the right set of adjectives, uh, big circular pink thigh, silver driving car, and not really silver circular driving pink thigh, pink car, uh, big pink thigh, pink car. All right. So that's that. Now, you know, as people are building these models, people wanted to know how to talk to these models, and that's basically what is called as prompting, right? So essentially, in the in the uh, you know, and how to get really good results from these models by talking nicely to them. Now, one of the ways of talking to these models is called chain of thought prompting. Chain of thought prompting, as many of you might know, is different from standard prompting. In standard prompting, you basically just tell the model, here is an example of how do you answer the question? Give me the answer to this question. In chain of thought prompting, you basically tell the model that here is an example of a question and this is what I would think so as to be able to generate this answer. These are the reasoning steps that I would do. But uh, now, given the next question, do the reasoning steps and then tell me what the answer is. Okay. And there are more examples on the right side, which you can also look at uh, later when you look at these slides. The slides, by the way, are up on the tutorial website, so you might want to download those slides as well and, and have a look at them, but you can do that later as well. Right. So the nice part is that you could tell these models by a very simple instruction. Let's think step by step, uh, you know, uh, that, that they must think step by step. They must do the reasoning steps also. So your prompt would contain several few short examples, few short examples in the sense demonstration examples that you will show to the models to make them learn, right? And this prompt could basically not just take the question now, but also a reasoning step part, a rational part, reasoning step part, chain of thought part, part whatever you want to call it, and then the answer. Okay? So that it will be, it, it would also generate steps and then the answer. And what people observed is that uh, there are many, many interesting advantages of these chain of thought. Of course, the first big advantage is that if you basically took uh, uh, math word problems, right, from popular data set called as JSM 8K, uh, a large 540 billion parameter model could only give you about 18% solve rate accuracy, solve rate basically on those problems, right? But if you did chain of thought prompting, that accuracy would rise from 18 to 57. Now, isn't that awesome, right? Uh, so not just the accuracy, not just that you would basically get better accuracy, but you could also improve interpretability because rather than the guy just saying, here is the answer, you know, without any reasoning, it would tell you step by step why that is the answer, right? You know, unlike my eight year old, you know, if I ask her, a, if I ask her a question, she basically tells Papa, here is the answer, you know, but uh, several times I have to basically persuade, coax, do whatever possible and ask her, tell me why do you think that is the answer, right? Uh, and interestingly, these models uh, now with chain of thought prompting would basically tell upfront why it thinks this is the answer and then come up with the right answer. Okay? And, and the chain of thought prompting, as you saw with the math word task, it could also lead to really good results with common sense reasoning, symbolic manipulation, many, many, many other tasks. Right? So it became super popular. Uh, here are some examples of how chain of thought prompting helps improve common sense reasoning across several of these data sets, uh, like CSQA, common sense questions data set, data understanding, uh, sports understanding, uh, uh, or, or even you know uh, robot actions kind of uh, generation uh, tasks. So um, several different tasks, right? Here, what you see is basically x-axis is the size of the models, y-axis is the solve rate, and then you have uh, various kinds of methods like standard prompting, the black line, which is basically typically the lowest line that you see here, right? And then uh, the bluish line with a big circle, which is chain of thought prompting, typically above the black line, uh, the black thin line, which basically says chain of thought prompting is better than standard prompting. Okay. Uh, and post that, essentially several models came up, many, many models, many, many large language models and small language models uh, designed by several uh, you know companies and universities, right? Um, and mostly the large, large, large language models, you know, 100 billion plus models, 100 billion parameter models came from companies for obvious reasons because they have great compute and infra. And uh, small language models came from universities. 
but the smallest language model started coming up only when Meta actually did a very awesome thing. In Feb 2023, they basically released a model called as Llama. Uh, Llama is a 7 billion, uh, they released a 7 billion parameter checkpoint. And that basically motivated all the research that happens in academia post that, right? Because academia had no compute power to be able, uh, you know, at least uh, I can broadly say that, uh, you know, they, it, it was difficult to find compute power infra to be able to train 100 billion parameter plus models in academia, right? And therefore, most of these models that you see here came from Google, OpenAI, Microsoft, um, and, and companies of that kind. Uh, but uh, several of the models that you see here, like Alpaca or Vicuna and, uh, and, and many others basically came from academic labs as well. Now, no, not that you know, small language models didn't come from uh, industry. Of course, many, many small language models like Llama 2, Phi, Mistral came from industry as well. And there is research on both sides, you know, on really improving large, large language models, very large language models, which are closed source, right, and available just as APIs, like GBD 4.0 or OpenAI's O1, right or recent versions of Gemini and so on, right? And there's also research in small language models field where people have been trying to recreate smaller and smaller language models, but still retain the benefits of, uh, you know, the reasoning abilities, the uh, other abilities of these, of these large language models, right? So uh, the small language models field was really driven by, uh, by Meta uh, through their different versions, Llama, Llama 1, Llama 2, Llama 3, Llama 3.1, 3.2 recently, right? But there were other things as well, like Falcon and Mistral, uh, you know, from different companies, which also contributed to this field, including the Phi series from Microsoft, right? Uh, um, and, and Orca series as well. So Orca and Phi both came from Microsoft. Um, now, if you think about it, these small language models uh, were trained still with really large amount of data. Uh, these models, they don't become generic just, uh, you know, just in simple ways, right? You have to pre-train them very, very rigorously. You pre-train them on very large amounts of data using crazy amount of large infra, large number of GPUs, that is, right? And for large amount of time, right? So that's that. But uh, uh, some of these models, they could basically still work, although they are small in nature, because they were trained in specific kind of ways, Right? In specific kind of, uh, uh, you know, instruction following ways, like, uh, you know, doing like explanation tuning or uh, uh, cautious reasoning or certain kind of specific kind of prompting them. Right? So they became small and still were able to do the task nicely because they were trained in specific kind of ways or trained with really clean data. For example, clean web data to train Falcon or really clean data to train textbook kind of quality data to train five series, right? Or the third thing was by changes in the architecture slightly beyond transformers, right? Beyond typical transformers. For example, using rotary position embeddings or using, uh, you know, uh, let's say sliding window kind of attention or different forms of attention or using, uh, you know, mixture of uh, experts kind of uh, training. Clearly, uh, what held further was doing uh, RLHF uh, and, and the direct reference optimization as well. Right. So that's the way people train small language models. And given the amount of time, I'll really not go into details of, uh, of, of these small language models, but uh, you know, uh, offline you may want to look at these slides and basically uh, uh, appreciate how these small language models, even 7 billion parameter models, could actually sometimes be better than 175 billion large language models across many, many tasks like question answering, reading comprehension, mathematical reasoning, core generation, and so on. So, and, and as I said, all of this started when Meta released Llama 1, uh, a 6.7 or a 7 billion parameter model, um, and, and many others basically fine-tuned on top of that. And again, I'll skip some slides like Llama 2, Llama 3, where people have just basically shown how their models are coming closer and closer to these uh, really large language models uh, like, like Claude or, uh, you know, GPT-4, uh, and, and they're trying to close the gap with those large language models so that they perform as well as these large models while being small, while being able to be deployed on edge devices or laptops and so on. Okay. Uh, uh, by the way, if you don't know, um, you know, Microsoft recently launched Copilot Plus PCs where you actually have NPUs and uh, those NPUs are capable of uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, loading these small language models and running them on laptops. So, so in some ways now, you know, Microsoft's mission is no longer having a laptop on every table or every home. You know, it's like having a GPU in every home, having a GPT at every home in some ways. Right. So that's that. But well, I mean, you have, you basically see across many tasks, these models have basically started trying to close the gap with, uh, with, uh, with larger and larger models uh, while being smaller in size. 
right? Uh, many, many kind of reasoning tasks that you see here, not just constrained to text based reasoning, but image based reasoning as well. Um, and uh, as I also said that the research in large language model field has not stopped. OpenAI is innovating every day. It's just to come up with better and better models, trying to come up with models that can actually beat humans, uh, even in complex tasks like answering professional exams and academic exams to a really good level. So these are these are various exams like GRE and uh, LSAT and uh, you know uh, various kinds of uh, APSAT and so on exams. And you basically see that GPT-4 is trying to close the gap, be much better than 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 the sometimes even better than the than the best exam taker. Uh, and and although not shown here, people have also shown that these models can uh, can can really could get uh, really get like silver medals and gold medals in Olympiad style question answering. OK, so there are more examples of what all these models can do, and I'll sort of skip those examples like, you know, uh, later you can look at the chart understanding chart reasoning over charts, reasoning over images, reasoning, uh, 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 you know, do geometric kind of reasoning, reasoning over geometric images, right? Um, uh, or also doing multimodal reasoning. So given this image and asking a question, uh, a geographic question or a temporal question, they can answer that nicely. Humor kind of reasoning, again, very difficult, right? Human, humor is so difficult to understand, but these models can actually understand and explain that as well. Common sense reasoning, uh, which reflects culture as well, right? Uh, or or uh, uh, reasoning and code generation. I mean, understanding uh, what the what the um, you know customer requirements are and generating appropriate code related to that. Uh, mathematical reasoning, video based reasoning, understanding. Uh, uh, so this this video is interesting. So if you basically watch this video, the question is how could this person improve their technique? And uh, look at the guy you know trying to kick the uh, kick the ball, right? And the model can actually come up with a very, very awesome answer. And as a human, I am not really in this sport, so I may not be able to talk about, hey, how can this guy improve on this soccer skills? But well, the model actually can do this kind of reasoning as well. Right? So this is basically this that was a very quick intro to large language models and what they can do today. Okay. Uh, specifically, now in this second part, right, there are totally six parts to this tutorial, as you observe here. Specifically, in the second part, I'm going to quickly talk about uh, how do you generate annotations for several kinds of reasoning tasks using large language models. Right? Uh, I will particularly go into details in, in these four different kinds of reasoning tasks. Arithmetic reasoning, common sense reasoning, logical reasoning, symbolic reasoning. Okay. Uh, many of these will be double clicked and, uh, you know, and discussed in detail by Subha and Monica later. Uh, but what I will do is to sort of introduce, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, ways of doing these kinds of reasonings, arithmetic, common sense, logical and symbolic reasoning uh, beyond uh, what I already described, beyond just doing chain of thought kind of things. Okay, Chain of thought is great. I mean, uh, of course, that is the basis of how you can talk to a large language model or, a, or even a small language model for that matter. But chain of thought has its own issues, and that is what we will discuss in these in this in these parts. Okay, so large language models with chain of thought are non-causal reasoners. What does that mean? That basically means that uh, many times people observed, and you can look at these, and again, you know, pause the slides uh, in this video, or essentially look at these slides later as well. But many times, what people observed is that if you gave it a math question, please act as a math teacher and answer this question. It would come up with wrong answers sometimes, and sometimes it would basically make mistakes in these steps, which are highlighted in red. Okay. By the way, you know the many of these pictures and slides that I have. I mean, many of the uh, content that I have taken is already uh, you know is taken from the links that are mentioned at the bottom. So you can always click on that link later and uh, read up more in that paper. Okay. But uh, the idea is that uh, several times these large language models would go wrong, and uh, that's okay. Reasoning is wrong. The answer is wrong. That's one. Right. But the other kinds of mistakes. Mistakes like, hey, the entire reasoning was correct. You did every step correctly, but just the right, the, right, the final answer was wrong. You know, it's like making a silly mistake in the exam where you answered the question completely correctly, but all the steps were correct. You made a mistake in the last last part, right? And therefore got the answer wrong. But that's wrong, right? Sometimes also what could happen is that your reasoning was all wrong, but your answer was correct, as if you basically copied from the guy next to you. Okay, so just the answer part. All the reasoning was wrong. You wrote some random stories around there, but your answer was correct, right? Now that's basically not good, right? Of course. So, so the large language models oftentimes make these kind three kinds of errors, right? Uh, the answer is wrong, reasoning is wrong, but the dangerous errors are when the answer is right, but the reasoning is wrong, right? 
Uh, of course, the new techniques like in-context learning, supervised fine-tuning, reinforcement learning, they all significantly help improve these kinds of things, but, uh, but models still make those mistakes, right? Uh, in fact, people observe that different kinds of models, you know, different kinds of models like LAMA2 uh, uh, or, or uh, these, these different sides of models make different kinds of mistakes. So, for example, um, you know, some of these models, uh, um, sorry for that, give me a few seconds. Uh, yeah, some of these models essentially uh, like GPT 3.5 Turbo, GPT 4, you know, all of these models uh, make different kinds of mistakes. The level to which they basically depend, uh, come, come with the answer by having a dependency on the reasoning steps is different. Okay, so let me try to explain this table to you here. You know, Z is basically the original instruction, the task, the question, the math question that the, that the user provided. X is the reasoning steps and Y basically is the answer. And what you would expect ideally is that the model should basically, uh, you know, uh, the, the model uh, should uh, uh, essentially um, uh, take the question, come up with the right reasoning steps, and then based on the reasoning steps, come up with the answer. So there should be no dependence of the answer on the question in some ways, given the reasoning steps. Okay. So this is what is expected. This is the kind of relationship that you would expect between the three. Okay. And that's what these large models can help you do on some kinds of tasks, like math reasoning tasks and multiplication tasks and so on. Okay. But uh, logical reasoning tasks like Folio, well, uh, uh, you know, GPT 3.5 can do that. But, you know, if you look at small models like Lama 2, well, Lama 2 kind of models when doing these kinds of tasks, unfortunately, have no relationship between the reasoning steps and the answer. They basically directly have a relationship between question and the answer, but no reasoning between the re between the reasoning steps and the answer. Now, isn't that bad? That's too bad, right? You're coming up with reasoning steps, but they have no relationship with the answer, no correlation with the answer at all, or no causation, sorry, you know, uh, to, to come up with the answer. So that's bad. So, and uh, that's what these guys studied, that, hey, the chain of thought reasoning is good, but does it really help? So they basically concluded, well, it helps large models, but may not be helping small models directly, unless you do something really interesting in their, in their, chain, in their prompting to be able to elicit that kind of reason. Okay. Now, uh, other people sort of tried to understand this more, and they also concluded that correct answer doesn't always mean the correct reasoning. Okay. In fact, there are more examples where you see that the reasoning steps are screwed up, but the answer is correct somehow, right? So that's that. Uh, and therefore, what they tried to do is uh, uh, try to evaluate and quantify this better. They basically wanted to ensure uh, that we can evaluate how good the reasoning steps are. Okay. So they proposed something called as an auto race framework to automatically reason, uh, automatically come, in, come up with evaluation of the reasoning chains. And the way they would do this is very interesting. Okay. Uh, the way you would, they would do this is basically by believing in GPT-4, by, uh, by using GPT-4's ability to be able to tell some reasoning chains are good versus some reasoning chains are bad. Okay? So the way they did this is basically by generating first, uh, you know, a large data set of what are good reasoning chains versus bad reasoning chains. Okay? Use that data set. So this is basically the first step. You create a data set of uh, what are good or bad reasoning chains. Of course, bad reasoning chains, they assumed lead to bad answers. That's how they collected bad reasoning chains. Then they asked GPT-4, hey, can you look at this reasoning chain and tell me what's wrong? Okay, what mistakes did the student did the did the model make? Student basically meaning the model make, right? And then basically come up with the reason with the criteria of evaluating reasoning chains that hey, answer should be accurate, relevance should be there, logically it should be accurate, and so on. Come up with the sort of steps to evaluate the reasoning chain metrics or the rubric to evaluate reasoning chains, and then summarize. You know, ask GPT-4, hey, use this rubric or use this criteria to tell me how good this model is in terms of coming up with reasoning chains. Okay, so that's a, that's a great framework, and that that framework is really needed because you want to evaluate how good reasoning this model is doing. Right? And people evaluated this kind of a framework to evaluate how good, uh, you know, uh, 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 to to find out how good evaluation uh, this this framework is doing across several reasoning tasks, math reasoning tasks, common sense reasoning tasks, and logical reasoning tasks. And they found that their framework is really good compared to many other frameworks in finding out. Uh, wrong reasoning steps, right? So, of course, you don't just want good answers from these models. You also want good reasoning steps. And now, uh, basically, as, as it mentions here, it could detect 70.4% of incorrect reasoning chains, right? which other methods couldn't really do. On average, you know, across many, many tasks, it could basically find, in fact, even more. So the 70.4 is just for certain uh, benchmark tasks, right? mathematical tasks and so on. But for uh, on average, it could actually perform really better. Now, the other way of basically uh, sort of uh, uh, coming up with better answers is to avoid reasoning using text. So they said, you know, some people said that, hey, maybe chain of thought prompting is good, 
but you know all of this reasoning is not really the la is really you know the llm's cup of tea okay let basically llm just do what it is good at and basically depend on our other forms of reasoning says to be able to elicit good answers okay they said that hey let the large language model take the problem and create a program out of it so llm is not really good at coming up with these reasoning steps don't let it do that right that's bad it doesn't really come up with right answers like it screws up in this particular case by coming up with a final answer of 8 which is wrong actually right uh, or rather the answer is right but the reasoning steps are wrong here okay so therefore let the llm only create a program and then, you know, since the program, we, we, we know we have Python to understand how to execute a program. Let Python execute that program. Let not, let's not have LLM execute that program. Okay. And therefore, they came up with this nice, interesting technique. Uh, again, I'll skip the details due to lack of time, right? They came up with a very interesting program to be able, uh, a, a very interesting method to be able to convert these, you know, math reasoning problems to programs and then have, uh, you know, Python solve the pro, pro, uh, pro uh, I mean, you know, execute the program and come up with the answer. Okay, uh, and then of course they showed that their dynamic program prompting kind of a method uh, really gave really awesome programs uh, and led to a much better result than the standard chain of thought prompting. Okay, so basically prompting via programs, uh, and of course you can also feed, uh, you can also do few chart prompting on this manner in the sense give problem, give the program, give the answer, right, and give multiple examples of these triples kind, and then you know uh, uh, at the end just give the program and ask the model to generate the program, uh, uh, just give the problem, just give the text problem, ask the model to generate the program, and then the answer. So that was about arithmetic reasoning, uh, you know, so to summarize, basically people tried out uh, uh, not just evaluating how good the chain of thought is, but also tried to come up with a, a program kind of uh, a thought rather than text based thought. Okay. Now let me talk about common sense reasoning. Uh, common sense reasoning is uh, really difficult in that senses. And uh, the way people try to solve this problem is by having memory of thought. Okay. People said chain of thought is good, but uh, just to this parametric memory may be difficult. Okay? So it may be difficult for the model to just use parametric memory to be able to solve the problem. Okay? Uh, and if you think about how humans solve the problem, they basically, uh, you know, they have memory about how they have solved previous problems. So when I'm facing a new problem, I try to correlate it with previous problems. KNN reminds you of KNN, K nearest neighbors. I try to find cases that I'd solved before, similar kind of cases, right? And uh, uh, even if I have not solved similar kind of cases before, I try to generalize what I had done earlier and try to use that knowledge so as to be able to pre-think and then uh, you know uh, 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 and recall that knowledge and then use it in the current situation. Right. So basically, I have done some thinking earlier. I've solved some cases earlier. I use those thoughts, that memory of thought, to be able to solve the current problem. Okay. So, so, so you see, this is this is how the you know the the methods differ. The typical LLM fine tuning meant that you have to do LLM up, uh, you know gradient updates. Nobody wants to do that now, right? Well, obviously, OpenAI still allows you to fine tune their models, but nobody really wants to do that, right? Uh, people basically did chain of thought prompting, where people basically said, "Oh, I'll give the uh, at inference time, I'll basically give you the instruction or the task, and I'll tell you to think step by step and come up with the answer." But what these guys did was to basically come up with this memory of thought where they said that I have, uh, you know, um, I will I'll do things in two steps. I'll use a lot of unlabeled data to first create the memory. And, th and therefore, this is an offline step. I'll take unlabeled data. I'll give you several problems to solve, uh, much like making a kid learn how to solve problems. Right? I'll give you several problems to solve. And while solving those problems, you keep thinking, you keep generating your memory, and you keep putting your thoughts into memory. Right? But at runtime, I'm going to give you really, you know, a new example, and you're going to leverage that memory. At runtime, what you would do is to really take this memory which you have uh, created in the in the offline pre-thinking step, and use that memory so as to create candidates and leverage the right candidates. Now, given a new problem, you have to basically find the hill full memory. Of course, you have a memory of million things, right? Um, you know, uh, ladies have special memory, right? But anyway, you know, I'm not being sexist, sexist here, right? But you, know, you you extract that memory, you try to figure out that memory, uh, the relevant part of the memory, and basically use that memory to be able to generate the answers. That retrieve the right part of memory uh, for a given question and generate the right answer. Okay, so, uh, so, so that's what they did. And again, there are details. What do you put in the memory? How do you really uh, do this? At uh, How do you retrieve the right memory at the answer time and so on? Much like the retrieval augmented generation kind of framework that you might have heard otherwise. Okay. 
Uh, and of course, people showed that this memory of thought kind of a thing gave them really good results, not just for common sense reasoning. It gave good results on common sense reasoning compared to just doing standard chain of thought or standard uh, few short reasoning from, from large language models, but gave you really good results for other kinds of reasonings as well, like arithmetic reasoning or factual reasoning and so on. Okay. Um, now, the other part is this selective annotation part. And uh, this is very similar to the uh, to the memory of thought kind of thing that we discussed, uh, but uh, uh, this one basically does not just depend on unlabeled data and just depending on the LLM to generate memory. Okay, so it basically creates memory using a larger language model. So they basically say that hey, I will still do two steps. You know, there will be a pre-thinking step, and I'll store something in my memory. But the memory is not going to be free text. The memory is going to be really labeled examples. Okay. So, so in some ways, these are more controlled because it's not like you'll have just some random free text in your memory or random chunks in your memory. You'll actually have labeled data in your memory. Um, and uh, this you do offline again. You know, you will do selective annotation at, uh, in an offline scenario, uh, but uh, you will use this labeled data which has been obtained using some really large language model like GPT-4J or, or, or GPT-4 and uh, GPT, GPT-J or GPT-4, right? Some large language model. You will generate that uh, uh, you know annotated data, uh, uh, labeled data, and then at runtime you're basically just going to use it as extra few short examples, relevant few short examples to come up with the right outputs. Okay, um, so uh, in the offline part, it is really like active learning. So basically, you you need to select those examples which could be confusing for your small language model, and select diverse enough examples so that uh, the model can make best use of them. Right, so they come up with a vote key kind of a method where they basically try to obtain key interesting examples such that uh, um, they are diverse um, as well as uh, you know they are they are confusing for the large language model uh, 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 to be able to answer and uh, therefore come up with uh, uh, helpful examples in that sense. Okay. Now next let's let me talk about logical reasoning, right? So uh, uh, logical reasoning, uh, uh, of course, you could basically just do zero shot prompting and ask the model, what is the area of the square with these four vertices, right? And the model would come up with some answer. Now, um, the answer is not good. And as I said, as people progress, they started doing chain of thought prompting to elicit good answers. Think step by step, give better answers. Also give some examples, demo examples, and it gave even better example, even get better answers. But these guys uh, essentially came up with this method called as analogical prompting. Now that's another way of talking to your bot, okay? talking to your model. Okay? Uh, so not just do chain of thought prompting, not just do few short prompting, but do analogical prompting. Now what's analogical prompting? Analogical prompting is basically explicitly telling the model uh, to essentially, uh, yeah, it's basically following this, this human notion that humans think about related problems and use high level or use high level knowledge. Okay? So basically when I'm given this question, what I'm going to tell the model is that, hey, you know, recall relevant examples. I'm actually telling the model at runtime now. Okay? Remember the previous method that I talked about, they created memory of thought, stored it on some offline memory. Okay? Uh, or they took labeled examples and they stored it in offline memory. But analogical prompting guy doesn't have an offline memory. It basically tells the model that first recall relevant examples, then solve the initial problem. Okay, so basically, um, at runtime itself, you tell the model recall relevant examples. So it's going to actually print out relevant examples. Okay, and then it's basically going to solve the problem. And the idea is that uh, you know, as you tell the model that you recall relevant examples, it's basically bringing it into its RAM in some ways, you know, in the working memory, and that just helps it come up with a better answer. In fact, they extended this method further, and they said that let's not just help the model recall relevant examples and solve the problem. But also, let's help the model first understand what kind what kind of problem this is. Right? Remember, if you basically try to study uh, uh, for interviews with uh, uh, all these companies like Microsoft, Meta, and Google, you know what do you do? You basically try to figure out, try to learn those interview questions, read that book, and try to understand different buckets of problems, right? Dynamic programming problems, you know, greedy uh, algorithm kind of problems, and so on. So that's the that's the way you can tell the model. You tell the model first, try to understand what are the core concepts that you will use to solve the problem. Then you basically try to generate relevant problems and then basically try to solve this problem. Of course, this increased the size of your output significantly, but actually, as you see here, on various kinds of tasks like GSM 8K, math accuracy, so many reasoning tasks, so many other logical reasoning tasks as well, you basically see really good answers uh, using this analogical prompting method. Okay, So that's that. Now, 
um, yet another method is this lean reasoner method. And lean reasoner method, basically, um, several of you might already be familiar with lean. Lean is basically a theorem, theorem proving symbolic solver framework. It's a popular, popular knowledge reasoning framework. Right? And these, these people also said, hey, LLM is not really great at doing reasoning. Let's not ask the LLM to do the reasoning. Let's use LLM to do what it is great at. Okay. So if you have a question of this kind, this is a, a very interesting logical reasoning puzzle, right? The cow is big, the cow likes the dog, the cow, where is the dog? A very traditional kind of a logical reasoning kind of a puzzle, right? And the question is, does the cow like the cow, right? A very interesting question, right? Uh, and then you have uh, three options, so true, false, or unknown, and you have to basically find the right answer. Now, of course, for an LLM to basically parse all of these predicates and make sense out of them, so as to be able to come up with the, uh, the answer is difficult. And what do you do with now? You basically combine the power of LLMs with the power of lean reasoner. Okay, and the way you do that is basically ask the LLM to formalize and come up with all of the, um, you know, um, all of the basic predicates, axioms, theorems, constants that you see here. Okay, uh, so it breaks down the uh, context. It breaks down the question as well. Okay. And then you have uh, this framework called as tactic generator and proof search framework. Now, of course, you make ba you basically make use of lean reasoner so as to do proof search, and you make use of this tactic generator so as to generate tactics. So what it does, uh, so what are tactics? Tactics is basically taking this uh, uh, question, does the cow like the cow, formalizing it like cow cow, and then being able to uh, break it down into sub goals, right? The several sub goals, so that you know if any of these things lead you to the sub goal, that's great, right? Do these things lead you to the sub goal or not is the problem that the lean tries to solve, lean framework tries to solve. But coming up with these sub goals is actually done by the LLM, which the LLM is good at. Okay? So basically the idea is to combine the power of the large language model and combine the power of the reasoners uh, so as to be able to solve these problems. And what do you observe? You of course observe that lean reasoner under certain kinds of uh, you know, uh, settings and so on can give you uh, awesome results, not just the correct answer, but also the correct proof, which is really important, right? Uh, there's a correct proof in, in these popular proof writer and folio data sets, uh, which is basically about first order logic and, and higher order logic kind of things, okay? I'll skip the examples for sake of time, but again, you, you know where to look up good examples. Right? Uh, let me also talk about this event relational logic. So now many of you might be already familiar with event relational logic, where given a paragraph or a sentence like this, a large fire broke out at the way to a supermarket in some street, half of the roof at the entrance of the store collapsed during the blaze. Okay. Now the question is basically get me relationship between fire and collapsed. Right? Now, you know, the model does a good job at several other things, saying that there is no co-reference relationship, there is no temporal, uh, well, uh, there is no, uh, 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 there is no sub-event relationship. So collapsing is not a sub-event of fire and so on. But, uh, and then it basically also rightly finds causal relationship that uh, collapsing is a cause, uh, I mean, the fire is the cause for collapsing. But unfortunately, temporal relationship is too bad, right? Simultaneous. Now, the model doesn't have the logical capability of understanding a basic, basic logical uh, temporal logic constraint that if event A causes event B, how can event A and B be simultaneous? A must happen either before or overlap with event B, but you know, if you and A and B occur simultaneously, they can't have a causal relationship. The other way around cannot be present, right? So, uh, so therefore, the model needs to be, uh, you know, uh, augmented with some some way of telling it that, hey, don't come up with logically inconsistent answers. You came up with three correct answers, co-reference, causal, sub-event relationship were correct. Why the hell did you screw up, you know, this temporal relationship? Okay. Um, so there is this temporal logic rules and constraints and so on, which you can basically tell the model to follow. Um, and, and these guys basically came up with an interesting framework where they basically also tell the model, hey, here are temporal logical lo logical constraints, you know, just follow them and make sure that you don't uh, um, screw up the answer in terms of coming up with inconsistent answers. And then they came up with really good results across, they showed very good results across several models on two popular uh, temporal logic, uh, event relational logic uh, data sets called MEVEN, ERE, and uh, causal time map. Lastly, yeah, I'm, I'm almost uh, done. So let me quickly lastly talk about symbolic reasoning. Okay. Uh, now people, uh, I already summarized many, many reasoning frameworks, right? Basically saying that, hey, large language model by itself may not be good. And therefore people said, hey, let me use the model to generate programs. Let me use the model to basically generate, uh, uh, you know, uh, predicates that lean could follow. Let me use the model um, to basically, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, generate things, but following temporal logic constraints. You know, let me use the model with memory of thoughts and so on, right? 
Now, in a symbolic reasoning world, people said that, hey, um, I, on, I, I want to improve the accuracy for, of, you know, of the large language models on these reasoning problems by also having the model do symbolic reasoning. Okay. So here you see an example. Adam had five apples. He ate two apples for breakfast. How many will be left if he eats one more? Now, of course, the model can come up with some answer and the answer may or may not be right, but you can improve the accuracy if you also tell the model to do symbolic reasoning. Symbolic reasoning basically means replace the numbers by variables and then ask the model to come up with a formula to answer the question and then use that formula to actually answer the real question. Okay. And what people observe is that uh, the model is uh, great at doing numeric reasoning, great at doing symbolic reasoning as well, but the model can be made even better when it does both together. So the way it does both together is that you basically first give it the question and then make it come up with the, uh, you know, um, I mean, give, give it the question self prompt by actually giving it the answer as well. So essentially, uh, you know, uh, here is the answer. After, so, so the model itself takes the question, generates the answer. You take the answer to the model generated and make another call to the, to the model saying, here is the question, here is the answer you generated, and here is the symbolic reasoning question come up with the re symbolic reasoning answer. And as you see, here the model does wrong, W minus X, but here when it is given an actual problem and then a symbolic question, it comes up with a symbolically correct answer. Okay? This method, they call it self-prompting. So basically to be able to solve symbolic reasoning problems, you know, if you basically give it a uh, give it an actual problem, a numeric problem, and then you essentially, you know, uh, you, you give it the numeric problem, come up with a numeric response, and then ask the, uh, uh, give the model numeric question, I mean, the self-prompt methodology, final methodology is like this. Uh, you have a numeric setup, that's the task uh, that you tell it, and give it the question, and you give it a chain of thought prompting kind of thing, it comes up with a numeric response, and then you basically tell the model, hey, align and tell me, uh, you know, align in the sense that the numeric and symbolic responses should align, just the variable should differ, right? So then you take the symbol, uh, take symbolic task, um, uh, you know, uh, instruction, give it the symbolic question, chain of thought prompt, get the symbolic response, and then, you know, again, give the symbolic question uh, and tell it, hey, give me the answer that you got in the response, because finally the response will be a full answer, right? You basically just want this W minus X minus Y part. So that's that. So basically saying that symbolic reasoning problems can be solved by large language models uh, in an accurate manner if you prepared it with an actual numeric reasoning problem. Okay, so that's the takeaway. A uh, model may not be good at doing symbolic reasoning by itself, but prepending with a numeric reasoning problem makes the model much better. Uh, really, the last last slide, more or less, you know, uh, the idea is that uh, the model by itself may not be really good at doing symbolic reasoning, and therefore, uh, you know, the way you can actually make the model better at doing symbolic reasoning is uh, in two steps. Take the complicated problem of this kind, especially when the problems are large, right? This is the setup where you're trying to do uh, reasoning uh, for machine reading comprehension kind of task. So you have a very large machine reading comprehension task. And uh, uh, so you have a large passage and you have a question uh, and you want to come up with the right answer. So what you would do is to take this large passage, have the model break it down into sub problems, potentially using symbolic symbols, symbolic reasoning, right? And then use some sort of reasoning method like uh, ILASP and so on, you know, to be able to come up with. So what you would do is to take this large passage have the model break it down into sub problems, potentially using symbolic symbol, symbolic reasoning, right? And then use some sort of reasoning method like uh, ILASP and so on, you know, to be able to come up with these answers. Yeah, so basically it could use uh, some framework, some knowledge reasoning framework to come up with the answer to these broken down small questions. And then you still use the large language model to understand how do you combine these partial answers to come up with the final answer. Okay. That's basically uh, the symbolic rule learning kind of a way to solve complicated, uh, you know, math problems in machine reading kind of scenarios. Okay. Okay. So, so I think in, to summarize, what did I do? Well, I tried to give you a glimpse of how people have tried to apply large language models uh, broadly. So, using chain of thought prompting. But then I also tried to delve into various kinds of reasoning uh, examples and showed how people have tried to solve those reasoning examples by combining the uh, combining the you know the power of large language models with other kind of reasoners like lean reasoner, ILS reasoner, or a Python interpreter, or essentially you know asking the model to um, just break down things into predicates or break them down into simple small sub problems and so on. Okay. Hope that helps. Hope that gives you a very good understanding of how people have been using large language models to generate annotated data for reasoning tasks. 
Uh, Supa will go into details and talk about it before we take the break. So Supa, please go ahead. Uh, I'll stop yeah. here.